The first thing you should know is actually right here in the preferences, we have this tab called record warp launch. What behavior live is going to execute when we import a long sample versus a short sample? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm simply gonna turn warping on. But now you'll see that it's just loading this 120 segment BPM because my global tempo here is at 120. Now, <clears throat> placing the one, place the one, position the one. This is the single most important step that you're gonna do when you're warping. Because if the one is off, everything's off. And as you can see here, Ableton is saying that the one is here because that's the start of the audio file. But as you can see, uh, whoever was the mixing and mastering engineer, uh, as they should, they left a tiny little space there. And the reason that you do that is so that you make sure that, um, particularly if you're doing hardware recording, sometimes it takes a second for the compressors to engage. So you wanna just give a little bit of pre-space uh, right before that first beat hits. But what we need to do now is uh, align, as we can see here, Ableton's markers with the one, the one point, you know, 1.12, 1.13, and so on with the actual uh, tempo of the track. And this is basically a uh, transient detection. Ableton has automatic transient detection and it's gonna detect basically where the zero crossing is on that first uh, beat. So Ableton will do, detect that for us automatically. So that's great. So I can make a, I mean, I can wake, make a warp marker anywhere, but I can just go here, hover in, and double click using the uh, transient assist uh, and now there it is. Now I've got a warp marker correctly positioned at the one. By the way, should be noted, you can you have to always have one warp marker in your clip at a time. You always have to have one. So for example, if I wanted to go in, you can double click to delete. If I wanted to go in and delete this warp marker, I cannot, I cannot. There always has to be one, and that one is gonna be determining the, that first position. So double click to create a warp marker. Now I can double click to delete that original war marker, which you do want to do, by the way, because if you leave it in there, it's gonna screw up the algorithm trying to detect the tempo. So clean it up, delete that original one. Now we just have one war marker. Now, right click, set 1.1.1 here. So that's that first downbeat. Now we can see Ableton's one, R1. Okay, so now the ones are aligned. Oh, oh, we're halfway there. Um, so, okay, so now we kind of know what we're looking for, which is always useful. Uh, and now I'm gonna go ahead and right click. And there's a bunch of different options here. There's warp from here. There's warp from here, starting at 120 beats per minute. <clears throat> there's warp from here straight. So warp from here basically assumes that this file could be anything. It could be uh, like we're talking about, the acoustic folk musicians banging on a cajon with some sort of wily tempo changes. Um, or it could be a house music track, you just never know. So it's gonna basically be looking for any uh, major transients that it can use to detect and then snap those to the timeline. And then we have War From Here Straight. So War From Here Straight assumes that it's more or less a track which is very tightly on the grid. So we're gonna do War From Here Straight and then we're gonna cross our fingers and we're gonna see, we're gonna put Ableton to the test how well it can warp this track, how accurate we can get. Boom! Came out perfectly. Reading waveforms is sort of a, a science, but it's also sort of an art. But one of the things that you can look out for that very clearly will help you determine whether there's a change in the song is by looking at the density of the waveform. So we can see here on the left, very thin. Right, not a lot of density. Then we can see here on the right, a lot of density, right? A lot of energy in that wave. That is probably a snare drum hit. It's like, psh, right over top of that. And we're, we're creating, we see that real increase in energy. And you can almost pinpoint exactly where that change happens right here. Make a warp marker here. And then what I can do is I can click this and then drag it over. And because I did this all the way at the end, what that also did was that adjusted every other part of the track. So now everything between these two points has been warped. Then my goal becomes very, very singular, which is place the smallest amount of warp markers possible. Also, a little trick, sometimes you can just bring that over and then delete that warp marker. And now look, it didn't move. 
still in that same position. But now I'm back to just having only one more marker. So this makes me very happy because this is very clean. And now if I play this with the, uh, the metronome, now we can hear it's going from 100 and it's going up to 120. And now when I change my tempo, it will change with me. Remix. You can sample that and then just... The warp mode algorithms. Uh, this is very, very important because it's going to drastically affect the tonal quality of your sample, particularly if you're either speeding up or slowing down more than five beats per minute. So when you look at a waveform here, essentially what beats mode is doing is you have here the transient, yeah? And then you have here this kind of like space right before a transient actually hits. And what beats mode does is it'll compress or expand that space right before the transient. So you still get that nice punch on the top of a kick drum or the hit of a snare. Um, and it's just that little silence, because especially beats tend to be a little bit more sparse. They might be like boom, ka, boom, ka, boom, ka, boom, ka. Well, in between the boom and the ka, there's just kind of like we're just waiting. So it'll compress or expand those sections, right? So there's a le the least amount of uh, degradation to the transients. Okay, so, wait for it. <laughs> Granular synthesis. Now, let me tell you about the strange and exotic world of the grains. So, all right, uh, the best way that I like to describe granular synthesis is if you think about very old films, very old films, meaning like a series of snapshots that when you play them together quickly, it appears as though they're in motion. Or like a flip book. You guys seen flip books, right? You draw a bunch of pictures, you kind of move each thing, and then you play it, you play it back, and wow, it looks like the dog is running. Um, that's basically what granular synthesis is. What we do is we, we take the sound and we break it up into these little pieces or slices, which are then called grains. They're literally called grains. And then what we can do is we can determine how quickly or slowly they play back. And we can also determine the size of the grain, the length of the actual grain. So how big or small of a snapshot are we actually taking of that sample? And then that's how we slow it down or speed it up. With both of tones mode and textures mode, you can adjust the grain size. So do we want like very, very short samples? Or do we want a little bit longer samples? We'll just start on tones mode. So you can hear very, very, very short grains. By the way, I have this slowed down a lot on purpose. So that way you can actually really hear the effect of the processing of the algorithm. Because if I just play it at like a similar tempo, you're not going to hear it. You're going to be like, eh. Um, okay. And then we can make the grains longer. You can't automate grain size, unfortunately. I wish you could, but what you can do is resample it. Yeah, automate grain size. Um, how would you like mess with the dynamics of the flux? Like, you know how it's like chopping into bits and pieces, but like, yeah. it's not necessarily messing with the volume, is it? It is not. It is not. Is there is there a way to like make the dynamics crazy? Like have like the short one be quiet and then the long one be like louder, stuff like that? The, yeah, I mean, anything is possible. Anything is possible with an Ableton. It's just a matter of how are you going to go about it. Um, there's not a direct way to do that, right? There's no velocity uh, parameter which is set up. Um, the thing, like, say you were my client and we were in the studio and you were like, Liam, dog, I love this. It's dope, but come on, baby. You need. You give me a lot of nicknames, apparently, in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> but come on, we need to get some velocity in there. I'd be like, hmm, OK, interesting. So one thing that we could do is we could bring in, for example, a Max for Live LFO tool and assign that to clip volume. And then we could actually have that uh, sort of modulate in real time to be 
louder, quieter, louder, quieter, so on and so forth. So that would be one sort of workaround solution. Would you have to like automate it? Or? Well, with the, no, because with a LFO tool, you can just assign an LFO to the clip modulation. So you're not automating anything. So an LFO uh, is a low frequency oscillator, just like a HFO, high frequency oscillator, which is the type that you hear. So when you play, for example, a square wave at you know, 1.2K or A at 440 hertz, that's a high frequency oscillator. It's, it's cycling 440 times per second, mm -hmm. which is a lot, AKA high frequency, higher number. Uh, and then it's cycling so fast that it generates a tone, which we can hear. Wait, it, what's, the, what's the frequency range for the low? low uh, well, the frequency LFO. range, oh, of an LFO? Yeah. Uh, typically, it's going to be below 20 hertz. Oh, uh, okay. Right, because the range of human hearing is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Right? What's a, what's a kilohertz? 1,000. 1,000 hertz. There it is. So from 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz is the range of human hearing. So uh, below that 20 hertz mark, that's your LFOs. That doesn't generate a pitch that is audible, but what you can do is you can assign that wave to modulate a certain frequency. So for example, you could have a triangle wave mm. that, is, that is oscillating at a certain frequency, which is still fast. It still could get very fast. Um, it can move the volume, the clip volume, up and down very, very quickly. But essentially, that would be a workaround. Yeah, oh, assign an LFO to clip volume, for example. Um, and you could have not just a sine wave, but you could have a random wave. So it's randomly oh, okay. changing the clip volume. All right, and then, uh, okay, so now, next we have repitch mode. Repitch mode. Uh, can anyone take a stab at what repitch mode might be? That's like a wild guess. I think it changes the pitch of the sample. Yes. Okay, why is that unique or interesting? Because you get different sounds out of it. Why is that unique or interesting compared to all the other warp mode algorithms that we have available for us? Huh. Essentially, when we're warping, whether it's a loop, whether it's a song, whether it's an acapella, there's a very important relationship that we have to keep in mind, and that is the relationship between tempo and pitch. Tempo and pitch. Because essentially, what these algorithms, except for repitch mode, do is they have discovered a way for us to de-link tempo and pitch, which is really interesting. So you can slow something down, but retain the original pitch. You can speed something up, and it doesn't sound like a chipmunk. It has the original pitch. So if, some, if you have a sample that's in C major at 100, but you drop it to 90, if you were unable to delink tempo and pitch, then it would no longer be in C major. It would be like some other key that probably doesn't exist because it would be like a microtonal scale because there's not a precise relationship between 100 and 90 that's going to work out for you in terms of the harmonies. So <clears throat> this is actually a very revolutionary con concept in digital audio because in the early days of digital audio, aka the 90s, um, you could not separate pitch, and time. If you wanted to slow down a sample, you were stuck with the, the, the lowering of the pitch. If you wanted to speed up a sample, you were stuck with that increase in pitch. This was a very big limitation. And Ableton was one of the very first pieces of software that came out that actually was like, hey guys, not only can we separate tempo and pitch, but we can do it well. Because previously, like early iterations of, of um, uh, pitch and tempo separation sounded terrible. I mean, they sounded bad. Like, you wouldn't even want to use it because it just sounded so artifacty. So when Ableton came out and they were like, hey, not only can you separate time and pitch, but we'll make it easy, fast, and fun, that was, that was, that's one of the big reasons why Ableton is so popular today. That's why it was so popular with DJs and particularly people who perform live because this is like now something that used to be incredibly difficult. I don't know if I told you guys, but Back in the day when I um, was first learning how to produce with, with Bass Nectar, he was my first music production teacher, we had to break out the calculator every time we wanted to time stretch a beat. I'm serious, because it didn't do it for you automatically. We were using Rebirth, which was a program which came out before Reason. 
you, you, so we're like, okay, we want to slow this down. You know, we break out the calculator. Okay, well, we're at 100 and the, the sample's at 112. And then we'd have to figure out how many milliseconds that we're going to have to change the sample in order for it to sync up. Yeah, we had a whole formula and everything. Those days are over. But yeah, so it's a brave new world. So anyway, repitch mode. Um, also, what I fondly like to refer to it as vinyl record mode. So for any vinyl record DJs in the house, crickets. Right here, we got one, we got two. Uh, we'll soon have three. Yes, that's the spirit. So it's the same thing. So if you, if you adjust the pitch slider on the, on the record, the tempo goes down, the pitch goes down. So vinyl record mode. All right, so let's listen to it, shall we? But you hear how clean it is? You're getting the full expression of each sound. It's not stuttering, it's not looping, it's not glitching. It's the full expression of the sound. Just down low. You know, if you need to do sound design on the next Jurassic Park movie, I'm just saying, repitch mode is gonna be your friend. So this, so, so this doesn't affect the sample rate? No, this does not affect the sample rate. This is just literally dropping the tempo, dropping the pitch. Wait, why does it sound a little slower, or is that just me? Uh, well, I'm at 20 beats per minute. Oh, okay. So, yeah, yes. so, you, so you drop the pitch, <laughs> you drop the, I drop the, the tempo. tempo and the pitch. Well, the pitch just follows. The oh. pitch follows just exactly the same way. So, okay, imagine you have a record playing. You're a manly guy, you gotta like analog stuff, right? You've played a record. Yeah, so you have a record playing. Now, if I slow that record down, just, I slow down the rotation. Now it's no longer spinning as fast. What happens? It sounds like that. Exactly right. This is mimicking exactly that physical quality. So pitch, tempo are now linked. It's the only mode where they're linked. So that's why repitch mode is very special. It's the only mode where they're linked. All the other modes, delinked. Here's the cool thing about loops. Um, if we go back to the preferences, Remember this, uh, auto warp uh, short samples, or do you, do you want to loop slash warp short samples? I have that turned on auto. So you have some different, different modes here. It can do an unwarped one shot, it can do a warped one shot, it can do a warped loop or auto, which is auto detect. It'll try to detect if it's a one shot or if it's a loop. Um, it'll loop a loop and it will not loop a one shot, which is dope. So I leave it on auto, that works really well. Um, auto warp long, long samples is off. You can also change your default warp mode I usually leave mine on beats because a lot of times I'm importing just like some, some little sort of tonal material, but I can, uh, or, or uh, transient material. Now, if I go back, so I have, my, I have my audio sample. Now say I wanted to add some kind of a loop on top of it. So I could go in here and look at some breaks and then maybe say, okay, some drum loops. We'll add some drum loops on top. So if I drag that in, now you'll see what's happened here. Ableton has already warped it. Ableton has already told me what the segment tempo is, 127.99. Like I said, it's not always perfect. Beats mode is because the preferences are set up to default to beats mode. And then preserve uh, the transients. So now if I play this on top of this, it should just sync right up. And if I wanted, I could change that to repitch mode. Kind of cool on drums. But I kind of like repitch mode because it keeps it really clean. It's very clean. Now, if we wanted to make this a little tighter, I could double click here on my snare and just drag that in. And then now, it's even tighter. And if you guys want to get crazy and combine what we've learned, you could use some clip automation. Go in here, click the E. Here's my envelope, here's volume. I could actually go in, say for example, I just want those snares. My best advice is to always just take it slow, take it easy, use the least amount of warp markers as possible, cross-reference with the actual tempo, tapping it or looking it up, um, and as always, just practice, practice, practice.